the history of after school. After school programs are now part of the community landscape. By after school, we're referring to school and community based programs. This has been driven by a family need for after school supervision of youth, as well as the need for youth to have expanded learning opportunities. Over 10 million kids across the country are participating in after school programs. This figure does not include summer learning programs. After school programs employ over 550,000 workers. A few of these workers or other after school stakeholders are aware that after school has been around for a long time or that the important contributions that after school programs have made dating back to the early 1900s. Due to the large public and private investments, after school has greatly expanded and become a field of its own. Thus, we need to document, share, and celebrate our history with others. Think of education, social work, and medicine. Each has a documented history. We have a growing body of literature and research, but can do more to fully document our history in America that dates back to the early 1900s. In this documentary, we attempt to tell the full story of the history of after school, its important role as a unique institution serving low-income youth, as well as lessons that we can draw from this history. We also look at the contemporary after school field and look to the future of after school programs. This documentary is largely inspired by the research of Robert Halpern and his book, Making Play Work, The Promise of After School Programs for Low-Income Children. The history of after school in America begins with an understanding of the social upheaval and changes in family life that came with the period of industrialization in the United States. The seismic changes included the shift from hand labor to machine technology or factories, the placement of factories near big cities, which attracted workers from the countryside. It also included the need for factory labor, which resulted in a large wave of immigration and the use of child labor. These changes served as the preconditions of the after-school movement, which later resulted in a huge demand for child supervision. When I think of the history of the after-school field, what stands out for me is it's an unbelievable, uh, rich history that dates back to the 1800s, in fact. Uh, we're, we're talking about settlement houses and private charities and day nurseries that had services for and care for after-school kids. We go back much further than um, the 21st century community learning center programs that I think a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, we're a new field. Um, in fact, we're not. None of the cataclysmic changes taking place in the 19th century, in my opinion, would have happened without industrialization. Whether it be child labor, uh, the movement from rural to urban areas, increased numbers of immigration. The, the industrial era in the United States, or the Industrial Revolution, as it's sometimes called, is the period roughly 1880 to 1915 in the United States. There was a need for labor. There was a desire for the cheapest labor possible. That often ends up being immigrant labor, uh, labor of people of color, female labor, and child labor, or the agrarian period, uh, that results in a shift from hand labor to machine technology. That's one of the essential characteristics. Production before the industrial era was done mostly by hand. Industrialization impacted um, lots of different aspects of American life. Uh, family, uh, work, um, childhood. There was a shift in population in the late 18 and early 1900s from rural areas to urban areas. Well, there are jobs in the cities, so families move from rural areas to urban areas. By 1900, the estimates are 
that 50% of all American families now lived in cities as opposed to the countryside. A hundred years earlier, only 3% of all American families uh, lived in cities. And the largest wave of immigration to come to the United States is roughly between 1890 and 1915. Uh, during the period of the Industrial uh, Revolution because there is a need for labor and the cheaper the labor the better from the employer's point of view. Essentially what we have between 1890 and 1915 is 17 million immigrants coming to the United States. This in a population of less than man, 90 million. So, so that's about one out of five uh, folks in the United States were newcomers and they came from places that upset often native-born Americans. Children have always worked, but with the Industrial Revolution, children now work in the market economy. They now become a commodity, like any other form of labor. And because they're children, they can be paid even less than immigrants. The issue is that children now work outside the home in factories. Uh, young girls, 14, 15, all, uh, you know, worked in garment factories. Young girls also worked inside the home uh, in what we call piecework. Young boys worked mostly outside the home. Some worked inside the home. But young boys during the industrial period were not, worked outside the home. Some worked in coal mines, often as young as seven years old. At about 1900, the estimates are that about 20 to 25 percent of immigrant children worked outside the home for pay. And even as late as the 1920s, the income that children made constituted about 30 percent of the family income. So it's significant. The Progressive Era was largely res a response to the Industrial Revolution. During this era, we saw the enactment of laws that prohibited the use of child labor, the beginning of compulsory education and public schools, as well as progressive views on education and childhood. You know, the Progressive Era followed um, the great wave of immigration in the mid-1800s and also was formulated in response to the Industrial Revolution that occurred. And we see some very similar things going on in our society right now. That settlement houses and the after-school field are trying to meet the needs of working families and trying to meet the needs of an increasingly diverse population. So I think there's a lot we can learn from the progressive era. The settlement houses, I think, did a really good job of responding to both of those issues the Industrial Revolution, and the great, um, the great Immigration, I think it was called. At the beginning of the century, uh, after-school programs were called after-school programs. Uh, they were settlement houses or uh, organizations like the YMCA that were created primarily to help uh, immigrant families, since that was a high time of immigration, help immigrant families get socialized and assimilated. Yeah, compulsory uh, or mandatory um, uh, education occurs really about 1900, the period we're talking about. Because, um, and, and what it means essentially is education by law. The advocacy and development of the public school system in the United States takes place at this time. Because with the passage of child labor laws, the decline of children working outside the home and the increased number of immigrants who have children means there needs to be some alternative system to educate and control the next generation of workers. That becomes compulsory or mandatory uh, education, which develops at about the same time. By about 1920, the number of immigrant children working, which was about 20-25%, was cut in half, was cut in half. Um, as we start to develop this consciousness that childhood should not be exploited for profit. I think the Progressive Era had a big impact on our notions of childhood and our notions of education. That the prog progressives understood that social and emotional and physical and moral and cognitive development 
were all connected with one another. I think they also understood that it was important that schools be connected with other parts of their communities. One of the most interesting pieces of the Progressive Era history to me is that John Dewey, who is recognized widely as a leading educational reformer in the United States, he had a very close working relationship with Jane Addams and the, uh, some of the other women leaders of the Progressive Era. So an educational philosopher is linking up with a group of people who are reforming other social institutions and really understanding that schools need to be connected to youth development organizations, to the courts, to the public health institutions. Sometimes in our history we forget that the, how, how important those connections are, but I think if we go back to social welfare history and to the history of the progressive era, we have a gold mine of understanding of what it really takes to get all young people to productive adulthood. As young people left the mines and factories and entered public schools, children were unsupervised between the end of school and the time that their parents ended work and returned home. Combined with the desire of immigrant youth to escape the crowded conditions of tenement housing, society was faced with the dilemma of what to do with hordes of unsupervised youth. The control and education of children presents a real dilemma because if children are in school, let's say roughly nine to three, by law, and if parents don't come home from work because of the long work day and more and more women entering the workforce until six, seven, eight o'clock at night, what's gonna happen to children after the restricted time of school and family time often four or five hours after kids get out of school. That's a problem. Uh, so before there are after school programs, children were both pushed into the streets and attracted to the streets. Remember, most immigrant children live in tenements. They live in terrible housing, tremendous squalor four, six, eight kids in a family living in a one-room tenement in a nine-story building. There's a rush to get out of there. So the streets were a natural attraction and, and lure for children. The positive, well, let's do the negative thing. The negative thing about the streets is that they were not safe. The biggest cause of childhood deaths at this time, 1880 to 1915, were accidents that occurred in the streets. They also were places where your child could quote unquote hang out with the wrong kind of kids. There was a concern about delinquency. There is a concern about alcohol. But there was no organized place for children to hang out. There was no safe place where children could play. During this time, we see the emergence of the playground movement and the birth of youth programs led by settlement houses, religious and charitable organizations, some of which grew to become national organizations like the YMCA's and the Boys and Girls Clubs. So there was a really interesting period in American history um, and an interesting movement that was in fact um, part of the Progressive Era, really at the beginning of the Progressive Era, called the Playground Movement. I guess we all assume that communities have always had playgrounds, but the fact of the matter is that in the mid-1800s, there weren't playgrounds. Children were playing out in the streets. The streets were very rough in um, many of the cities. Um, and the playground movement started in nine urban areas around the country where social reformers 
were trying to do at least three things for young people. They were trying to give them a safe place to play. They were encouraging young people to engage in physical activity. And they were making sure that young people had adult supervision. So the idea was to supervise kids' play in formal, uh, in formal settings, if you will. Uh, the estimates are that by 1920-ish, uh, um, local governments had spent $100 million to build 4,000 playgrounds in the United States. But given the fact that there are tens of millions of immigrants and their children, and given the fact that African Americans were, because of segregation, denied the opportunity to, to engage in the playground movement, and there weren't enough playgrounds, it still did not completely solve this problem of what to do between after school and before family. Well, when we think about the early history of after school, it wasn't called after school. We're going all the way back to settlement houses and the YMCAs, and basically it really was an opportunity for uh, folks who were new to this country to get oriented, to get settled, to make sure they were in very basic ways being socialized to American life. Uh, so the earliest forms of community-based programming for young people really were focused on sort of in a very positive way socialization um, and also protection while their parents were working at seven. Like other human service institutions, after school organizations work to respond to the great issues and challenges of the day. During the great immigration of the early 1900s, youth programs offered socialization to their new country. In World War I, the focus was on helping young people deal with fear and loss. And during the Great Depression that followed, the concerns were nutrition and hunger. When I, th when I think about the history of after school in America, the thing that stands out is how the programs have always had to respond to larger societal trends and needs. They haven't really driven their own agenda. They've been trying to fill a, a need that society saw for them. So for example, in, you know, in World War II, it's an easy one. You have many women going into the labor force in World War II that weren't working prior to that. The primary purpose of after school programs, and there was an expansion then, was childcare. There were both expansion of childcare for young children, also for kids school age. Working overtime on the riveting machine When they gave her a production knee She was as proud as a girl could be There's something true about red, white and blue About Rosie, the riveter In the late 20th century, the challenge was about the effects of poverty, including delinquency, drug addiction, teen pregnancy, gangs, and school failure. Between the mid-1980s and the early 2000s, there was a huge growth in the number of after-school programs. Like in earlier times, this was influenced by societal factors. These came together like a perfect storm that drove the modern after-school movement. The societal factors that have influenced the development of after school over the uh, years, I think, fall into three categories. One is the prevention of crime um, and uh, juvenile justice problems that many kids were facing during the hours between 3 and 6 p.m. The second was uh, changes in family structure and work uh, when women uh, returned to the to the workforce and uh, many women um, uh, experienced welfare reform changes and all kinds of things that um, made them having to go back to work so child care was a very important influence uh, in accelerating the field and then finally uh, the educational uh, domain that in fact what had really inspired a lot of the growth of the field in the 1990s was uh, the achievement gap and that kids needed to be, um, we needed to address um, a much better solution for kids so that uh, they did better academically. 
There were several important studies in the early 1900s and early 2000s that reported on the need and importance of after-school programs and informed the policies that fueled the growth. These studies also shaped the issues that these programs addressed. I think we have to be grateful for some of the early reports that came out back in the 1990s. Uh, the studies that I think propelled the field of after school, and I give credit to the Carnegie Report, uh, a matter of time that had been so important for us to put a spotlight on non-school hours for adolescents and for young people. I think there were several broad themes of the report. The first one was that there that there is risk and opportunity in the non-school hours when it comes to young people's development. We know that there's a lot of untapped opportunity in the non-school hours, and we were able to uncover some really important research about those opportunities. It uh, argued that there were uh, hours during the days of young people that were not safe for them and not safe for the community, and that we had to have programs to try and fill that safety need. And it also recognized that many uh, uh, kids were not going to be capable to go home after school because their parents were working increasingly. So this report was really the first time we acknowledged that there was a problem uh, that was more than just a babysitting problem that we needed to solve. I think before that it wasn't, it wasn't in the open um, a conversation that people were particularly concerned about what young people were doing during these non-school hours. But when you think about it, um, more than 60% uh, of a young person's time is spent uh, in out-of-school, non-school hours. It was reinforced later by the National Academy of Sciences in which uh, uh, chair people uh, like Jackie Eccles and, um, and others came to recognize the importance of promoting community responses for young people during their out-of-school time. When you have a report from the National Research Council or the National Academy of Sciences, you're basically getting a seal of approval that there is a research base, an evidence base, uh, behind uh, this kind of work. In this case, there's a value to community programs, and it also did two very important things for us. It defined what the characteristics of good developmentally appropriate settings are, things like safety and structure and important positive relationships and making sure that people have opportunities for skill building and for mattering, for contributing. Uh, and it also defined what the adult characteristics are that we're looking for in successful young people uh, and push that beyond cognitive development to say we need to be focusing on uh, the development of social skills, the development um, of uh, physical and emotional health. The Fight Crime Invest in Kids report was absolutely pivotal. Um, for engaging um, people around the safety issues and uh, they were one of the great advocates who I think really helped move uh, uh, the field forward with many of the reports that they did on um, why it's important uh, to support after school programs. We got involved in this and we were digging around looking at the data and came across uh, the data that talked about the, the prime time for juvenile crime. Um, the after school, the crime peaked uh, in the hours between three and four, especially, but also you know the hours three to six generally. Uh, we did a big report with some key law enforcement leaders, some leading criminologists, uh, presented it all to Attorney General Janet Reno, and that idea of the prime time for juvenile crime just exploded. And Deborah Vandell's work is very important because she's followed young people not just after one year of an after school program or two, several years, and finds that when students regularly attend quality programs for multiple years, they do better. Attendance, greater responsibility, uh, better achievement in math. What really comes to mind is the work of Reed Larson, who did some really important work looking at the development of initiative and engagement. What he found is that when children are in school, young people are in school, what they often are doing is putting forth a lot of effort, but they're not really uh, motivated. It's not something that they care about. What happens in after school activities when they're really working, when they're active, they're choosing those activities and they are also focused on them.
It's the, it's the, the best combination for learning. Don't get that freedom elsewhere to pick and choose, you know, what's relevant to me, what's relevant out there, what's new in technology, what's new in art. And here is where I get that freedom. So that's what really comes, keeps me coming back. During this formative period, we saw several important models develop. Many of these models were housed in schools versus the community. The ideas of the school is place and partnerships between schools and community providers was not new, but they caught on in a big way. These new after-school initiatives included the New York and San Francisco Beacon Centers, LA's Best, and other initiatives around the country. When I think about the history of after-school in America, um, one of the first things that pops into my mind is um, a film that I saw when I was going through orientation at the Mott Foundation when I got there in 2000. It's actually something that the Mott Foundation had been uh, uh, wor working towards for decades. So it actually started back when they created Community Schools Initiative in Flint, Michigan, where schools were essentially open um, from morning to evening to help support families as well. And so there was a community school director, and it was a vibrant community where uh, kids and young people were participating in hands-on after-school experiences. Furthermore, utilizing the neighborhood schools as community centers also made economic sense. Why should you pay $50 in taxes for schools and settle for only nine months of daytime use or 1,365 hours of school use a year? When you can add less than $3 on top of that and get 12 months of day and evening use or 2,535 additional hours of school use a year. Well, when compared to traditional public schools, I think the Beacon schools were innovative in several respects. First of all, their doors are open well into the evening. Traditional schools close at 2.30 or 3 o'clock. So they became um, a hub in the community for all different kinds of supports and services. It was also unique in the sense that this was about smart government. This was about using underutilized public space that lay empty on the weekends and evenings and uh, after school. And it was a smarter way for government to partner with nonprofit organizations and to partner with community groups in a new way to serve, to serve kids really in a new way. So I think that that was really what was unique about Beacons, in addition to the fact that it wasn't just about the use of school space, it was about how kids were served. And this was just at the beginning. The New York Beacons were uh, attractive because it was this coming together, this partnership between the community and nonprofits and school sites. It was about um, safe places for kids in the after school, using underutilized school sites. Teachers start to understand that all these things that young people do after school are actually valuable learning experiences. So it changes the whole culture of a school for both the children and the teachers. The Beacon program, they operated during the vacation periods, during the summer. They were open all the time. Some of them were open till midnight at night. I mean, this was some crazy stuff. And then these model programs like the Beacons, they were emulated right here in California. So we started to see similar type programs we saw in New York being emulated here, such as the Sunset Beacon. And I think that the Beacons help pave the way so that today many more organizations and many more schools can have this kind of relationship much more easily. The growth of the after-school movement was a response to the increased needs of working and single-parent families, as well as influential studies and reports telling the importance of out-of-school learning. It was also shaped by the contributions of powerful messengers like the After-School Alliance, the National Institute of Out-of-School Time, and the C.S. Mott Foundation. Messengers also included Fight Crime, Invest in Kids, which brought important support of law enforcement along with others. Well, uh, again, it's really important to advance the movement to have groups 
that are out there day after day telling folks the need. For example, the After School Alliance every five years does a survey of parents across America. So you need the combination of data, you need the combination of studies, you need a combination of uh, public will building advocacy groups at the state. Law enforcement definitely played a very big role in, in helping advance after school programs. What they really did is help shift the narrative. An important development was the move from a deficit model, which defined youth as a problem about to happen, to an asset model, which defined the kinds of support and opportunities that youth needed to be successful in school, work, and life. After school programs uh, have been associated with problems, uh, primarily because of funding. So we want to make sure young people are attending after school programs because we don't want them to use drugs or we don't want them to get pregnant uh, or we don't want them to be engaged in gangs uh, or be the victims um, of, of violence. I think that the after school movement uh, sort of pushed back against this uh, and said we're not just about preventing young people from doing bad things, we are also about uh, promoting uh, youth development. Uh, and so the principles of youth development, of making sure that young people have opportunities uh, to build skills, uh, to explore interests, uh, to contribute to their communities, uh, to learn positive ways to, to socialize with each other, all of those became an important part um, of the movement and we began to shift uh, from allowing the focus to be driven by concerns about young people getting into trouble, especially adolescents, um, to seeing after school as an opportunity for more informal choice-led learning opportunities where young people could uh, follow their interests, build skills, master things that matter to them and contribute to their communities. For me it's easier if it's hands-on because having a teacher just talk and talk and talk really won't get me to learn anything than getting actually physically like doing something that the teacher asks us to do like for example playing a guitar i actually want to play guitar so i can learn how to play the guitar and that's just how i really learn to actually try and physically do it well there's a this wasn't about fixing kids it wasn't about providing treatment to kids who were troubled in some ways it was about providing what every kid deserved uh, to learn how to be healthy, productive adults. Advocates knew that the scaling up of after-school programs could not be accomplished with private dollars alone. This depended on the allocation of public dollars. This was exemplified by the launch and growth of the federal 21st Century Community Learning Centers Initiative and the voter approval of Proposition 49 in California. Growth was also supported by national and local private foundations. As the after-school movement has developed, uh, and the reason the, uh, the federal government has invested in it for decades in the state of California, and the voters passed Prop 49 overwhelmingly in California to invest half a billion dollars, is based on studies and data that showed them that, in fact, this is the most cost-effective way. For every dollar invested, you get between 6 and $11 in return. One of the rare bipartisan movements in Congress is to support the investment in after school because of all these studies. The federal government started making a big investment in school community partnerships to expand after school programs starting in about 1998 to 2001 and 2 and has continued that investment up to today. Uh, it started out as a program with $750,000 for the whole country, seven sites. Now there's a $1.1 billion investment in 11,000 sites, a big growth. But the catalyst to actually move something forward and to fund the 21st Century Program came in a White House conference in 1997 that First Lady Hillary Clinton called with Democrats and Republicans with a bipartisan conference with hundreds of leaders from foundations, business, youth groups came together and decided that all three of these areas we should start working on. And that then caused interest in looking for something in the federal government that you could fund to grow that would help address those three concerns. And that was the 21st Century Community Learning Centers. Little history lessons critical here. At that point in time, when the big growth from $750,000 to $1.1 billion all happened in four years, and rarely happens, uh, Congress at the time was, in the House was controlled by 
conservatives who did not want a federal role in education. So you're asking people in the House, representatives, who don't like federal intrusion to fund a federal program. They like the idea that a foundation or foundations would provide the technical assistance, leadership development, and training, not the federal government. So the Mott Foundation and other foundations, but particularly them, uh, said we could provide through all of our grantees and allies across America, training, technical assistance, leadership development, uh, so that the program can get off the ground and running quickly. And that was very important. And it turned out that um, Bill White from the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation and uh, the Secretary of uh, Education, uh, Riley, and uh, his colleague, Terry Peterson, were all very interested in uh, helping with um, low-income kids doing better academically. And they saw this as an opportunity to bring together public and private funding. Um, and I think that was the inspiration behind it. And then with uh, presidential support from the Clintons, it started to go to scale. But if you think about it, it's a very, very successful example of where private dollars um, stimulated uh, government and public dollars for uh, a cause that they both felt very strongly about. So the Mod Foundation essentially, we spent our money on the things that would help support the growth of that public funds. We spent it on research, we spent it on promising practices, we spent it on professional development, and we spent a lot of it on, on supporting policy and public awareness. The opportunity for that to occur came um, when uh, uh, President Clinton came into office. And um, I think um, by far for, for, for Bill White, who is the president and CEO of you know, the foundation at the time, it for him became um, one of his um, most treasured initiatives because it was finally the ability to take some of the things that foundations can do and take it to scale that would help more kids and more families across the country. And we were able to grow it from a million to a billion in four years. So now Arnold Schwarzenegger, before he was governor, because he'd been involved in after-school programs, so he saw firsthand how it helps the kids. Arnold decided in California to take advantage of our ballot initiative process to fund an initiative, so he gathered signatures, but it would invest half a billion dollars so that California school districts have another pot of money they could access if they want to keep their doors open and run an after-school program for the very same reasons that the federal government also puts over a billion dollars available for after-school programs. The enormous increases in funding and program enrollment brought a new era of accountability. As a social program, after-school youth programs were asked to justify their sustained funding with data showing improvement in youth outcomes. These came as the after-school field was struggling to find its purpose. The challenge was ensuring that we hold after-school programs to outcomes that are realistic and focused on the needs of youth, not solely on the needs of institutions. Early on, the outcomes were narrow and focused on improving standardized test scores. Later, program outcomes were broadened to include measures related to healthy development. There was also a call for improving program quality which included the dissemination of best practices and the development of program standards. Once you start taking government funding, there's some expectations about the outcomes you're going to get, there's some expectations about who you're going to serve, there are expectations, you know, a, a range of things that come along. And so after school has struggled in that space because we wanted the credit, we wanted the funding, uh, we wanted the stability that comes with that funding, but you know, frankly we didn't want to be tied to academic outcomes, and certainly not exclusively to academic outcomes. When there's a major investment of government funding, either locally, at the state, or national level, then legislators are going to be asking, so what difference does it make? So the 21st Century Community Learning Center went from you know, under a million dollars to 1.2 billion, so people want to know what difference does it make. The Proposition 49 in California went from uh, a small appropriation to over half a billion in California. So it's natural that legislators who rep represent taxpayers are going to ask people, so 
What difference does it make? When after school went to scale, there was a loud call for outcome measurement and a call for program quality. Well, it turns out that you're not going to get positive outcomes unless you have quality. And I think it was at the time when uh, Deborah Lowe Vandell did some of her early work that we recognized that just participating in any old program is not going to result in positive outcomes for children. And it was at this point, I think, that we really um, saw an onslaught of the development of assessment tools, both self-assessment tools as well as evaluation tools. And um, it was the beginning of the development of national quality standards. At the national level, the National After School Association uh, developed national standards, as well as the um, states and locales. So now we have um, an amazing array of supports, both at the standards level and at the assessment level, to uh, promote quality. And therefore, we can be more sure that we're going to resolve uh, in high quality and, and positive outcomes. After school programs tended to be identified with the needs of younger children. High school after school was considered an oxymoron. This view was changed by the work of After School Matters in Chicago, the Beacon Centers in New York and San Francisco, and the After School Corporation. The inclusion of high school youth was advanced by the 2002 legislation in California, which dedicated 50% of all 21st Century Learning Community Center dollars to after school programs in public high schools. Fight Crime Investing Kids in California was an important ally in this legislation. For the idea of high school after school programs back in California in late 2000, early 2001, uh, we, working with a number of after-school stakeholders, organized a series of uh, listening sessions up and down the state. Uh, had about a thousand people participate, including a hundred law enforcement leaders, um, and came out with a series of recommendations. And one of the things that stood out was, this is great, we have an after-school program um, uh, in California that focuses on elementary and middle, but we need a high school program too. From sixth grade to high school senior now, I see how much I've grown artistically, personally, and professionally. You know, moving forward, I have a better idea of where I want to continue building these skills. I remember um, back in, in 2002, as um, the idea was percolating of let's create a high school after school program, uh, you know, the first people we spoke to, uh, the Drug Policy Alliance, which was trying to, you know, uh, deal with issues of substance abuse. Um, they came to us and said, you know, we really have seen all this great research on drug uh, uh, substance abuse prevention. Um, we should be talking together about after school. And we said, uh, absolutely. And then we were both called into a, a senator, a state senator, Bruce McPherson, um, who's a Republican in California, whose son had been uh, murdered uh, in, one evening in San, in, in San Francisco. And he was just looking from the, the victim angle and saying, what can we do to prevent young people from turning to crime. So, you know, this public safety uh, side of, uh, of um, after-school programs and the need for them really did emerge, and it's one of the catalysts here in California for the expansion that we had. And then also, uh, you know, it is very important that the expectations were, were built, that these same kids had programs in elementary school and middle school, um, what was going to happen in high school. And it made a lot of sense that we should continue to have programs um, all along the continuum. Uh, the California Assets Program too in California were revolutionary. I mean, just the funding with um, the bringing the uh, commitment of that 21st century dollars and saying that 50% of the money would go to high schoolers. Oh, that was un unprecedented, just the level of commitment. But in reality, I think no discussion of pioneers in addressing high school youth can be complete without acknowledging the contribution of Sam Piha. That's just the reality. He was both an advocate for the generous and dedicated funding for high school programs. In looking over the first century of after school, we see themes and issues that are similar to the ones we have today. An ongoing tension between school and community. Should after school be an important counterpoint to the school experience? 
the ongoing pressure for after school to address the issues of the day and the deficits of other institutions. After school programs tended to be underfunded and undervalued, resulting in their sometimes overpromising in order to secure funding. The belief that sustained funding of after school is not seen as the work of government, instead the work of charities and private funding, which is not consistent or reliable. A reliance on part-time, low-paid, and volunteer workforce. Concerns about professionalization, standard methods and quality. The question of outcomes. What should after school be held responsible for to show as outcomes? The difficulty of finding appropriate, dedicated program space. We are learning more every day about the important skills and experiences that young people need to be successful in school and life, the challenges they will face in the future, and the needs of specific populations of youth. This has expanded the conversation about what after school programs can or should address. We also know that after school programs will continue to respond to the demands from funders and the public. As a result, after school programs will continue to expand and evolve over time. A couple areas of recent developments that I think are particularly exciting. Uh, one is the whole STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, and providing opportunities after school and or summers with community partners, maybe with scientists, engineers, uh, but then also, in some cases, uh, including arts. And some really good examples around the country that have been able to take students that said, ooh, Science, man, I can't, I, I can't do that. And they go through the summer program, after school program, build robots, use dance and drama to learn technology or science and come out saying, you know, I think I can do that. We know right now there's a problem in America in that young people don't really want to become scientists. And sometimes that's because they're not having enough experiences to show them that they can do science, that they can be good at it, and they have a lot to contribute as scientists and engineers in our society. I think that after school opportunities are probably the most ideal way to reach kids with STEM. It's about opening up new horizons for kids. It's about allowing them to try something and love it, or try something and fail and do it better. Um, so all the things that we like about youth development can be done using STEM if we think of STEM as truly good for kids and not a bunch of facts that they have to memorize. We know from research that it's really important that summer programs in order to mitigate what we call summer learning loss, which can have a devastating effect on kids through their whole educational experience and really set them back. And you think about the amount of additional time for learning we can provide to young people in the after school hours, during the summer months. We can take that such a long way to help kids be prepared for the next step in school, to be prepared for the working world, and just as importantly, to be prepared for being productive, contributing citizens. Uh, the concept of social-emotional learning or social-emotional development or social-emotional academic development um, has really sort of come to uh, a frenzy in the past couple of years. Um, it's certainly come to the attention of schools um, over the past decade with a big push. So we now have a national commission on social, emotional, and academic development and a big call for us to pay attention to building these skills in young people in schools. Um, where does after school fit into all this? You would hope that we'd be right at the forefront saying we've been doing this for years, we know how to do it. We have an opportunity to shift our relationship with uh, K-12 education. Uh, from a where and when relationship, where do kids go when school is out, to really a what and how relationship. What skills should young people be building beyond academic competence uh, to be ready for adult success? So social emotional learning I think um, is coming up more and more as a important um, set of skills for young people to develop, um, particularly in the after school program and ideally all day long, both school day, after school, and at home. Um, what our organization 
has come to kind of embrace as our definition of SEL is really looking at that castle um, social emotional learning wheel which includes um, five skills so self-awareness self-management social awareness um, relationship building skills and then responsible decision making. Um, the after school program is the perfect place to practice SEL skills because of the flexibility in time, space, and content that we have. Um, we're not bound to some of the requirements and conditions found in a traditional classroom setting. There's no sort of homogenous category of young people, right? So urban youth, gay lesbian youth, African-American youth, Latino youth, suburban youth, rural youth, all of these young people have different experience in different contexts. Learning happens across a number of contexts, so it's not just sort of in-class learning. Uh, so young people learn, for example, in my own work around when they engage in youth organizing, when they're addressing you know, issues of injustice in their communities. For urban youth of color, that their own identities, around their own racial identities, their own ethnic identities, are also important um, in their own development, in their own meaning they, they sort of receive from instruction and after school programs. So many of the programs that I find effective with urban youth of color particularly pay attention to the ways in which race and ethnicity um, are integrated into uh, after school programming and activities. You know, much of the research on, on learning, uh, particularly in urban contexts, sort of point to, uh, you know, sort of point to the fact that, that particularly urban youth need to have uh, a learning experience that's engaged in the kind of conditions that they face in their communities. Gender-based programs are so important because we are not often looking at where inequity comes in in terms of gender in our schools and our communities. I think the most important thing in serving girls in after school is to really focus on giving girls the space to giving girls their own space. I get worried when we focus too much on girls in STEM and not on their emotional experience and the skills they need to succeed in any field. How do I as a girl in a safe space understand who I am, understand um, why I might be feeling, um, why I might be feeling resistant to new experiences, why I might be resistant to certain fields, certain uh, learning, and, and understand how to move through those, those areas of resistance, how to say yes to new things, and after school gives you that space, that time. We are trying to prepare girls, right, for success in their adulthood. And that's not just about getting A's in your report card. It's about having the, the um, courage to overcome all challenges. And our girls are, are not, don't necessarily have those skills. Another important way that after school is such an important environment for girls learning is in the research we have around growth mindset and one thing that we know about girls is that girls really suffer from perfectionism and we see this across the board in terms of across race across social social socioeconomic groups that girls are really often stuck in this need to do it right do it the right way, um, not look stupid, um, to not make a mistake. We see it all the time. It holds girls back from really, as we say in our program, take center stage and try something new. And so this research around growth mindset, around this idea that we don't come to um, a situation with a particular talent per se, that we get to learn and grow and we get to um, go, oh, I'm, I'm getting there, I'm getting better at something. I get to like try something, make a mistake, and try it again. 
is really, really important for girls. I think some of the needs that are happening in after school programs where they're becoming aware that there's a need to support young men in really um, specific ways is coming out of this idea that um, for so long there's been just a, a place of ignoring boys and allowing certain behaviors to be left as boys will be boys um, or that's just the way the boys are. And I think that what has happened is that has been let go for so long that young men have found themselves in a in crisis. Like, society doesn't give our young men really good tools of dealing with sadness and fear and shame and other kind of emotions like that. They, they're clear about what you do when you're angry. They're clear about what you do when you're happy. So if you don't, if you don't fit in the happy or angry, then what do you do with other emotions? Usually it comes out as anger. So, so everything is converted to anger or I just pretend like it doesn't matter. And then I get checked out to the world and then our young men go into this, um, uh, we call it, um, they isolate. Uh, quiet desperation of like, no one cares about me. And they begin to self-medicate, self-fulfill those feelings of, of not being a part of the group. Drugs, alcohol, rampant, unprotected sex, gangs, so many different behaviors they began to do, try and cover up the feelings that they're really trying to figure out, how do I deal with this real feeling? The after school space gives us a space to help our young men know that you're valuable. You may not do so good in your book work, but you got a lot of skills. The way the after school system works is it allows for some students to get a taste of something else, to get to see how good they can be at something that's not gonna be marked as a grade or got, not gonna take their creativity and crush it because somebody told you your drawing is not according to the rubric. And so it just provides a safer space. And so that's what we're trying to do in Ever Forward. We're trying to do more work around the social emotional development for our young men, um, teaching them to be social emotional leaders. So that doesn't just happen after school, it happens all day long. Finding equity or describing the meaning of equity, I think it can be very complex because too often the fallback, because it is complex, it's simply saying it means treating people equally. High standards for all doesn't mean doing the same thing or the same approach for everyone. And so I think to maximize the public investment, to deliver on the public trust, we have to consider equity and the related challenges as vitally important concept in our, in our design and implementation of after school. It really has to be at the top of our priorities. So when you think about you know, equity gaps, income gaps, um, the average middle class family is spending seven times as much money for enrichment for their kids as a low income family. It comes by sixth grade, that is 6,000 hours of learning. Um, there's a reason families are investing in this. It's not because it's nice. It's because they think this is going to help their kid get a job and succeed. So you know these after-school programs really um, is a, are a way to level the playing field for all kids so that all kids have the same chances um, to play leadership roles, to learn life skills, um, to get academic supports. Equity is very, it's just assumed um, for people who are advocating for after school programs that every kid deserves to have this kind of safe environment where they can learn and, um, and, and really exert themselves. We live in a time where there is enormous a uh, gap between rich and poor and um, divisiveness um, that seems to be getting worse. So the concept of equity is critical to everything we do when, as it relates to young people and families and to the after school movement. Um, we do not want to have programs that are for rich kids and programs that are for poor kids. Um, so the after school world can create a place where people come together um, and where young people have the same opportunities as people with money. I mean, it's still a huge challenge.
What we've seen over the last century is that families need access to structured youth activities after the school day. This will continue to exist in the future. This need is not going away. The exact form that these activities and opportunities will take depends on future needs and trends. It is important that we work collectively to maintain the public will that leads to federal, state, and local support for these programs. Further, it is important that we scale our expectations of after-school programs to the amount of resources that they are given. The challenge has been and will be to expand the funding we have and to get more states and municipalities finding ways to support after-school and summer programs and keep the federal government investing in this area. Any activities that uh, foster creativity, foster innovation, foster critical thinking, um, that um, allow for young people to use their imagination, uh, I think that those kinds of activities are profoundly important and um, oftentimes you, you, you don't find that enough in, in sort of conventional public school classroom settings. You've so I think, I think that um, our field still faces a challenge in that the vast majority of decision makers and even the public um, don't understand the potential of after school. So they think of after school as a great thing because it keeps kids safe, because it might help working parents, but they haven't gotten to the point where they recognize that it is absolutely essential to our workforce in the future. And of course we want all of our kids to be able to be full-fledged members of society where they contribute, where they have jobs, where they succeed. And so we can't ignore this vast amount of time outside the classroom where parents are at home where kids can be learning. Yeah.